So far in our journey to learn about cellular respiration, we have uh, talked about these three processes, glycolysis, pyruvate oxidation and Krebs cycle. Glycolysis, which takes place in the cytoplasm, involves the oxidation of one glucose molecule to yield two pyruvates, two NADH and two ATPs. The two pyruvates that are produced then undergo pyruvate oxidation in the mitochondrial matrix where for each pyruvate you get one NADH and one acetyl-CoA. So for the two uh, pyruvate molecules produced as a result of glycolysis, we have two NADH and two acetyl-CoA's. The two acetyl-CoA's then enter the Krebs cycle. Essentially the Krebs cycle occurs twice. So for the two acetyl-CoA's produced, we get as a result of Krebs cycle in the mitochondrial matrix, 6 NADH, 2 FADH2 and 2 ATP. So, so far we have a total of 10 NADH, 2 FADH2s and 4 ATPs. So far we have not talked about oxygen yet. We have not talked about oxygen and we have only a yield of 4 ATPs. Where is the maximum number of ATPs that are produced? Not here. The process that yields the maximum number of ATPs in the cell is the electron transport chain or the ETC. And it is the NADH and FADH2 that are produced as a result of these processes that contribute to this electron transport chain. Now, what is this electron transport chain? To understand that, let's take a look at the mitochondria because now we've moved on from the cytoplasm to the mitochondria, right? As glycolysis ended and pyruvate oxidation and Krebs cycle begin, we've moved on from the cytoplasm to the mitochondria. So the mitochondria, rightly termed as the powerhouse of the cell, has two membranes, the outer membrane and the inner membrane. The inner membrane has infoldings and within the inner membrane is a space known as the mitochondrial matrix. It is within this matrix where Krebs cycle and uh, pyruvate oxidation took place. So NADH and FADH2 are produced here. The space between the outer and inner membrane is termed the intermembrane space. And this is quite important. We'll come back to it in just a while. So what is the function of this inner membrane? So the inner membrane has a lot of infoldings to increase the surface area for ATP production. And how does that ATP production work? It takes place through the help of the electron transport chain which involves a series of proteins embedded within this inner membrane. And the proteins look something like this. So here you have the inner membrane. We have the intermembrane space which means the outer membrane is somewhere over here, the outer membrane. And then you have the inner membrane and then the matrix. So the electron transport chain involves a series of proteins embedded within the inner membrane. There are four protein complexes that make up the electron transport chain. Complexes 1, 2, 3 and 4. So these protein complexes are embedded within the membrane are, are stationary. They are not able to move. So there are molecules, there are protein molecules that can move between the two complexes. They are uh, coenzyme Q and cytochrome C. So all these protein complexes make up the electron transport chain. And it is in this electron transport chain where the NADH and FADH2 produced are utilized. And how are they utilized? So what happens is that these electron carriers are now filled with energy as they received the electrons as a result of glycolysis. They are filled with energy and they have to somehow give off the electrons so that they can come back to their natural state which is NAD plus and FAD plus, right? So to come back to their natural state, they need to donate the electrons that they have received. And the electrons, they are donated to the complexes in the electron transport chain. So what happens is that NADH donates electrons to complex 1. So NADH is at a higher energy level compared to complex 1. Complex 1 is at a lower energy state. So as electrons are being donated from a higher energy uh, NADH to a lower energy complex 1, energy is being released. And what is this energy used for? To answer that question, let's take a look at the hydrogen ion concentration across this membrane. So there is a high concentration of hydrogen ions in the intermembrane space 
compared to the matrix. So the energy that is released as the electrons are transferred from NADH to complex 1 is used to pump the hydrogen ions from the matrix to the intermembrane space. Why does this have to happen? It is against the concentration gradient of hydrogen ions, right? There is more in the uh, intermembrane space compared to the matrix. Why go to all the trouble of pumping the hydrogen ions from the matrix to the intermembrane space against their gradient? We'll get to that in just a while. So now complex 1 is at a higher energy level and it also needs to donate electrons to return back to its normal state. So complex 1 transfers electrons to coenzyme Q. What about FADH2 then? So FADH2 donates electrons to complex 2. Unlike complex 1 where there was a pumping of protons involved, pumping of H plus ions involved, when FADH2 transfers electrons to complex 2, there is no pumping of protons. This could be a reason why the yield of ATP from NADH is higher compared to the yield of ATP from FADH2. So from the uh, complexes 1 and 2 basically, the electrons are transported to coenzyme Q. They are transferred to coenzyme Q. So now coenzyme Q has electrons from both complex 1 and 2. So it is at a higher energy level compared to complex 3. So the electrons from coenzyme Q are transferred to complex 3. And again, because the electrons are coming down from a higher energy state to a lower energy state, energy is released. And this energy release releases more protons, pumps more protons from the matrix to the intermembrane space. So now the concentration of H plus is increasing even more in the intermembrane space. Why? Why? Wait, I will come to that. From complex 3, the electrons are picked up by cytochrome C. And cytochrome C then donates the electrons to complex 4 which finally contains oxygen. Yay, we finally see oxygen in the video. In the process of aerobic respiration, we finally see oxygen. So oxygen acts as the final electron acceptor in the electron transport chain. And as it accepts two electrons and two protons as well, one atom of oxygen, that is why I'm writing half O2, gives rise to water which is a byproduct of cellular respiration. As electrons are transferred to complex 4 from cytochrome C and as oxygen receives the electrons, more hydrogen ions, more protons are pumped to the intermembrane space. Now the intermembrane space has a lot of hydrogen ions compared to the matrix. And somehow these hydrogen ions need to find a way to come back to the matrix so that their equilibrium concentration can be maintained, so that the concentration gradient can be maintained. And how will they do that? The thing about the complexes uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, the proteins is that they are capable of only unidirectional hydrogen transport, unidirectional proton transport. They can transport protons from the matrix to the intermembrane space against their concentration gradient. They cannot transport hydrogen ions from the intermembrane space to the matrix down the concentration gradient. Then how will these hydrogen ions, these protons come back to the matrix to maintain their concentration? That is done with the help of this protein known as ATP synthase. And if you have guessed from the name that it is involved somehow in the production of ATP, then you are right. So what happens is that the protons flow down their concentration gradient through this ATP synthase molecule. And while they are flowing down, energy is released. And the energy is used to turn the subunits that make up this ATP synthase. This is sort of like a pump. And the energy that is released as protons are flowing down the concentration gradient turns the pumps in the ATP synthase complex. So the turning of the subunits brings ADP and inorganic phosphate closer together so they can react to produce ATP. Finally, we have produced ATP in the process of electron transport chain. So this process where ATP synthase uses the energy from hydrogen ions 
as they flow down uh, their concentration gradient is known as oxidative phosphorylation and this is why NADH and FADH2 are needed for this electron transport chain they are transported uh, between the complexes which results in the pumping of protons into the intermembrane space this eventual returning of the hydrogen ions through the atp synthase complex is known as chemiosmosis so the electron transport chain chemiosmosis and oxidative phosphorylation processes all three together give rise to the production of maximum numbers of atp within the cell so how many atps are produced within the cell so we know that the yield of atp from nadh is more compared to the yield of atp from fadh2 for every nadh molecule three atps are produced and for every fadh2 molecule two atps are produced so if we go back we have 10 NADHs so for each NADH we get 3 ATPs so 3 into 10 is 30 ATPs from NADHs to FADH2 so 2 into 2 ATPs which is 4 ATPs from FADH2 and we already have 4 ATPs as a result of glycolysis and Krebs cycle the production of uh, these 4 ATPs occurs by a process known as substrate level phosphorylation so totally as a result of cellular respiration from one molecule of glucose we get 34 from oxidative phosphorylation and 4 from substrate level phosphorylation giving a total of 38 ATP molecules but this is just an ideal number of molecules that can be produced from one glucose the actual number that is produced is much less than 38 because a lot of energy is dissipated in the form of heat and with this we are ending our journey of cellular respiration and ATP production we started with glycolysis we went to pyruvate oxidation and Krebs cycle then we moved on to the electron transport chain which with the help of chemiosmosis and oxidative phosphorylation has produced the maximum number of ATP.